Um, so hi everyone. Hi everyone here and everyone online. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so this is always a very exciting time. We're going to have all of the summer XR access research experience for undergraduate students give their presentations. Um, so this is your chance to share everything that you've been doing over the summer um, and some of the, the key findings and insights. Uh, so we have three groups of three. Each of you guys, each of the groups worked with a different uh, faculty member. Um, some of the students worked with me, uh, Shiri Azenkot, I should also introduce myself. <laughs> some worked with Steve Feiner, and some worked with Brian Smith. Um, Steve and Brian are over at Columbia. And um, so we're gonna have each of the three groups present together. And you guys are gonna get about 12 minutes. Try not to go too much over. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So during the Q&A, we'll take questions from everybody else here. So, you know, this is your chance to also ask each other questions. If you want to learn more, um, we'll take questions from people online. So uh, you can type your questions in the chat or um, raise your Zoom hands and we will look out for those. And um, yeah, we can have a, a nice conversation. Okay, so which group would like to go first? Okay. Yeah, there's usually one group that wants to get it out of the way. <laughs> um, and then do we have, can we have someone volunteer to take time? Sure. Okay, so at 11 minutes, give them a signal if they have one minute left, okay? okay. Hello everyone, I'm Tanisha. I'm, my name is Ruchi. I'm Helena. And we worked at Dr. Shuri Azenkot's Enhancing Ability Lab at Cornell Slack this summer. We primarily focused on a project about neurodivergence and social VR. So we split our presentation to three components. The first one will be going over how we arrived at our research question. The second is about how we designed our study. And the third is about the other projects that we completed during this project, during this summer. Yes. So neurodivergence is a social category that um, includes um, people whose brains function differently than what is considered standard or typical um, due to neurological and developmental conditions such as autism, ADHD, and learning disabilities. Researchers have investigated ways to make virtual reality more accessible to other disabled populations. For example, Collins, Jung, and their colleagues developed a virtual sighted guide to assist blind and low vision users in virtual reality with social interaction and navigation. However, research into neurodivergence and virtual reality is limited, with most work focusing on assistive technology. Um, in other words, tools that are designed specifically for neurodivergent people um, to assist in their daily lives. For example, the therapeutic tool Florio exposes neurodivergent children to various social situations um, in virtual reality so they can develop skills in communication, um, emotional regulation, and focus. While these tools may be um, assistive to people, to neurodivergent people in real life, they do not address the question of how we can make mainstream VR platforms more accessible to neurodivergent people. Next slide. To that end, we focused on the environment of social virtual reality. Social VR is a space where users can engage with other users in social interaction and engage in different activities like watching movies and playing games together. It is becoming increasingly popular because users can join from anywhere in the world to socialize, and many of these platforms, such as VR Chat and Horizon Worlds, are free, thus transcending financial and geographical barriers to social interaction. However, a need common to many neurodivergent people is difficulties with social interaction, and these arise due to, due to issues like misunderstanding or misinterpreting social cues, social anxiety, and sensory overload, which results in inefficient social and sensory processing. Since social VR is attempting to mirror real-life social interaction into a virtual space, these social challenges may be translated and even exacerbated in virtual reality settings, thus making it likely that social VR is inaccessible to neurodivergent people with these challenges. Thus, we focused on the need of difficulties with social interaction because it is a need that is widespread in the community but not exclusive to it. By focusing on this need rather than a specific population within 
the community. We hope that our findings will be applicable to people both within and outside the community who share the same need. Uh, next slide, please. Thus, we developed these two research questions. Um, the first one is addressing the specific challenges that people with this need face in social VR. And the second is how we can accommodate those challenges. Next slide. Okay, next is the design study. Um, so we asked the question, who will be recruited? Um, and individuals who face chronic social challenges in daily social interactions is the demographic we chose to be recruited. Um, this is because although our study focuses on neurodivergent individuals, we refrain from using the term neurodivergent because it's generally unfamiliar and misunderstood. Um, um, when we decided who to share our recruitment info to, we decided um, to share the info to Cornell Tech student groups, social challenge support groups, and neurodiversity organizations in New York City. Um, oh, thank you. Um, this is a hybrid study consisting of both participants who have and have not used social VR. So our in-person participants will have to travel in person to this Cornell Tech location, and they have no prior experience with social VR. And our virtual participants have prior experience with social VR. And the goal is to have participants explore the needs, explore their needs and preferences regarding social interaction in social VR. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, next is discussing the protocol. Um, we asked the question, how will in-person virtual user studies be formatted? Um, so in-person participants will interact with other users in social VR environment. Um, using the platform VR chat, um, and there's a graphic here for VR chat, um, and they'll complete a follow-up interview about their experience in VR chat. Um, online participants will participate in an oral semi-structured interview on their experiences with social interaction in real life and in social VR. Thank you, next slide. Okay, so what we'll be asking the participants about their social VR experience. Um, we mostly focus on a couple of questions to be asking our participants. <clears throat> Um, I've listed them up on the slides, but I'll go through them. How does socializing in VR compare to socializing in real life? Difficulties or barriers while socializing with people in VR? Um, does the environment, such as factors like graphics, sounds, and other avatars, uh, play a role in their social VR experience or <coughs> socializing in VR? Um, and then social norms or cues that are specific to social VR that are difficult to understand or navigate. Um, and, then, and then finally, how does their personal avatar affect their virtual interactions? Uh, thank you. Okay, so future work for this project, neurodivergence in social VR. Um, next step is to conduct user studies um, and then consolidate our findings into a paper and then possibly develop a prototype based on findings from our participants, both in person and in person. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the other studies that we helped on during the summer. First project is Accessible VR Non-Verbal So it's an accessible project for blind and low vision users. Uh, so basically we designed audio, intuitive audio cues for, for emotions and gestures such as nodding, smiling, or frowning. So how we use it is during like a conversation in VR environment, the sound will be played when the speaker has that corresponding emotion. So when so the blind and low vision users they can know the reactions of the speakers and the listeners during the conversation. Uh, so these are some of the uh, cues that we designed, like frowning, face enter, face exit. Um, we during the summer we helped write the protocol and also facilitate some of the user studies. Uh, we helped like organize the conversations and take notes. Based on the few studies that we participated, we have the following findings. First is the audio cues, they did help uh, users <coughs> understand group reaction to an argument, such as when they disagree, they can like shake their heads, they agree, they can nod their heads. But they also mentioned if there are too many people in the conversation, uh, the cues can be too frequent and it could be overwhelming sometimes. And most of the users also requested feedback for a more subtle body language. Uh, the second project I'm talking about is the 360 Video Saliency Project. Um, this, like the Neurodivergence in VR, it's a new project during the, started during the summer. Uh, so the motivation for this project is traditionally, VLB users 
Black and low vision users, they relied on audio descriptions to watch 2D videos. Um, however, there are some differences in 360 videos according to the research paper by Chang et al. Versus 360 videos, they have spatial information like where the object is coming from and also interactivity because you can rotate your field of perspective to look around. So because of these two differences, we can't uh, completely rely on audio descriptions to assist of the other users in 360 videos. Um, so that brings us to the research question, how do we leverage spatial information in 360 videos to make them more interactive for BLV users? Um, so with that research question in mind, how do we assist um, BLV users in 360 video watching? Um, we propose a method, a user study with a prototype, a simple prototype consists consisting of first a list of explorable key objects to select. They can pause the video and have their own path of exploration. That's like interactive. And second is to have spatial audio cues attached to those key objects uh, played when selected. So they can also get a sense of spatial information, the layout of the key objects. The third is in addition to key objects, there could be scene description to give a context of what's happening in the video. Um, so here are the next steps. First is to do the recruitment to um, get the potential users. And to conduct the user study, the purpose is to investigate the preferences of BLV users in 360 video watching and to evaluate the prototype. Uh, some possible future work direction is to automate the detection and labeling of salient objects. Uh, so we will move on to our acknowledgments. Uh, we love to thank our lab, including Dr. Sherry Asenkot and the PhD students, especially Jasmine, Eugene, and Lucy. And we also love to thank our host, Exer Access, and the other professors, Dr. Feiner and Dr. Smith, and the coordinators, Danielle and Dylan. Uh, we also like to mention this material is based on work supported by the National Science Foundation under these grants. And any opinions, findings expressed in these materials do not necessarily reflect the views of the NSF. Uh, here is the work cited page. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, hey, great questions. By the way, how did they do on time? Uh, 10.30. Oh, okay, good. good. So I have a question. Um, how are the uh, 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 audio icons coming along? Can you like uh, play one or two of them for us so we can hear what they sound like? Uh, I don't have a live demo right now. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you at least describe them? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so when you, there will be like a list of actionable items. Mm -hmm. You can like select this key object. So when you play, you click on it, there will be like a cue to tell you where they are because it's spatial audio. Mm -hmm. And there can be also a description or phrase played to describe the object. For example, a tree that you know is coming from that direction. Oh, I was thinking not, not of descriptions of objects. <laughs> Sorry. But rather the descriptions of your emotions. You had like smiling and- The NBC project. Happy. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about the other project. For NBC, um, so the nodding, it will be like dun dun. Like very positive notification, and smiling is also like a high pitch mm -hmm. harmonic chord, mm -hmm. so it sounds happy. Are they simply going to be discretized, like you smile or you frown, etc., or will you have like levels of smile? So, like uh, I think that's for or a big future you know. work. They were um, considering to adjust intensity mm -hmm. based on maybe the number of people that mm -hmm. express the emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is that to be specialized also? Yeah, everything is spatialized because okay. it's in the air. That's one thing that that for the visual icons, you know, there's a clapping icon and there's a thumbs up and thumbs, and there's nothing that does, yay, that was wonderful, yeah, versus, yeah. hey, that was good, yeah. right? Yeah, those are good questions. Yeah. One of, um, so you can do better than those. <laughs> there are some, uh, for, they've been doing formative studies, uh -huh. so some of the feedback they've gotten was that they could maybe use haptics to uh -huh. um, indicate like a higher degree of intensity mm -hmm. right. for whatever sound mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. being played, mm -hmm. whatever uh, motion is conveyed. And um, it's also been interesting to see in the formative studies, these, these um, 
facial expressions and mm -hmm. other cues like this isn't something blind and low vision people are used to really, or anybody is really used to paying attention to right it's uh -huh. something kind of subtle that we we get incidentally mm -hmm. we don't really think about it uh -huh. um so it's it's been a challenge to kind of follow traditional hci methods uh -huh. Because in traditional HCI methods, you ask people about it directly. Right. But it's kind of like asking people about an interaction technique. You know, right. people don't think about how they're typing. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't ask them, how do you like your keyboard? Right. Where do you want the T and the Y keys to be? Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So it's been interesting trying to adjust the methods to mm -hmm. get good feedback. Certainly people are used to responding to intonation in a voice, right? You know, someone said, yes. yeah, that was really good. That's not as, yeah, that was great. Right. right. You know, and even with the same words, I, I vary the words. I was trying not to do that. Um, you know, you you pay attention to the way people speak, um, the excitement or lack thereof in your voice. Right. When they're smiling, a big monster smile, a forced monster smile, or a real genuine one. Right. So, but you're not necessarily doing that consciously. And mm -hmm. people yeah. are also saying, well, I listen for the voice. Uh -huh. I don't need the, the extra feedback. So, yeah. So, it, right. Interesting challenge. We might need to construct the study in a way that makes the cues a little bit more obvious. Mm -hmm. We also have a question from Zoom. Then we can do that one. Claudia, do you want to unmute? We'll see if we can hear you. Hello, am I heard? Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, sorry. It took me a little bit because I'm using a screen reader, so I couldn't find the unmute button. No worries. Um, I'm completely blind and this research sounds incredibly interesting to me. The question that I have, well, I have two quick questions. One is, has there been any research done to apply this in an AR setting? And also mm -hmm. for the audio cues, has there been any um, discussion of, so are we determining like, is there some sort of description as to who's smiling or who's frowning? Or is it just kind of saying that somebody is smiling or somebody is frowning or somebody's nodding? Mm -hmm. Good questions. You guys want to take a stab at that? Uh, for your first question about research, um, we're not aware of any existing research, but some of our users have mentioned that they would prefer an AR setting rather than a VR setting, um, just because, like, for instance, some people may not be as attuned to virtual reality and they would find it more applicable for their daily use in, in real life. And for your second question, there's currently no way to tell who the cue is coming from. It's just an indication that someone is smiling or frowning. Um, there is a direction attached to it, but if they're very close together, it's uh, hard to tell where it's coming from. If the pe person, they're standing far apart in terms of angle, then you can tell where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And our users also have indicated this issue. Um, they've yeah. all indicated, well, the two that we've had so far, they've indicated that it's like a little overwhelming because there's too many noises and they can't tell who is queuing or not. Um, so that's something that we're definitely going to consider in the future. I think there was also a suggestion at one point to change, not just to, so that the sound is spatialized, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But also there was a suggestion to change the tone or to, to change it in another way mm -hmm. so that it's easier to distinguish between like, like yeah. Tanisha smiling and like Helena smiling, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they suggested changing pitch, like people yeah. have more higher pitch. Right. Okay. Yeah, those are that, good that questions. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Just to add one more thing that I think a lot of the work that we're doing in VR can, the, the findings from that can be applied also in AR is kind of a, a next possible direction. Okay, thank you very much. Lauren, would you like to go as well? Yes. Uh, I wanted to say that I think this is really interesting. I didn't know that this specific one was going on, and I'm really um, thrilled to hear about that as a multiply neurodiverse person. My question is um, to everybody who part of this is um, statement question. You've looked into um, the social uh, categories of this neurological. Has there been a difference noticed possibly with facial expressions and tonal expressions for people who may be, have been um, diagnosed later in life, or maybe culturally they may be from a different culture ethnicity or like a millennial compared to a Gen Z. Hmm. Sorry, that was a lot at once. 
Interesting question. Is this for the MVC or for the Neurodiver EPR project? Um, are you asking basically like, have we taken into account like cultural differences, like maybe age difference into our design? Um, age difference and um, racial ethnicity difference. Um, I ask this because um, I have friends who um, they're black and then I'm native and we've grown up differently. And they've grown up to where being neurodiverse wasn't like acceptable and to where mine was a little more acceptable, but my parents are like silent generation, like boomers. So now like in their later, in their early mid twenties, it's like accepted. And some of them make noises, which is totally cool with me. Um, it's normal, but I know that there was a lot of having to repress that growing up. So that's why I asked, because um, I know that you said that there's like facial recognition, which is greatly important, but I also know that some of us have had to mask for survival. So like this is, to me, it's a really important question because these are everyday things that people experience. I hope that's okay I asked this. Oh no, it's, it's a great question. Um, I'm just thinking. So when we decided, when we first started on this project, we wanted to stay away from the medical model of disability, basically saying that, like the medical model is basically saying that um, neurodiversity is something that needs to be fixed. Um, and that's not what we, that's not what we want to put across with this project, especially. So we made this project, especially because we wanted people to feel accepted with their neurodiverse characteristics. Um, and I definitely feel like this project is pushing the barriers, especially with like cultural differences, age difference. Um, since it's in VR, like anyone can participate. Um, it's like a con like it's a it's a conversation with multiple people in social VR. So multiple people can interact from different cultures, different ages. Um, but yeah, the goal of this project was definitely to stay away from the medical model. Like as you said earlier, like maybe you grew up with a lot of like with people telling you like neurodiversity was something that needs to be fixed. Um, but this definitely, we want to stay away from that. And we've researched examples of like what the medical model does look like, um, especially in like prescriptive games. So this definitely stays away from that in our hopes and our research. And Lauren, um, just to clarify, we haven't conducted the study yet because we're still pending approval from um, the Institutional Review Board. But once we got to the um, conversation interviews themselves, we are definitely interested in exploring the intersection of different identities. Because like, for instance, we know that growing up in a stigmatized environment has a different impact on your um, identity with and your relationship with neurodivergence than growing up in a more supportive environment. So we'll definitely try to tease out the ways that these intersections like impact how people um, approach social VR. Thank you. I appreciate you answering. Um, I'm sorry for throwing a lot at once, uh, but I really do you know, care about those things and I appreciate all of the work you've done. I'm really impressed. Thank you for answering them. Oh, thank you for thank asking. You, um, how, how much time are we doing like a certain uh, amount of time? 20 minutes or so per group. Okay. Okay, Brennan. Yeah. <laughs> do we have the next group set up? Yeah. Uh, as you guys set up, we can take another quick question. Sure. I just had a quick question, which was on the neurodivergent VR project. What What do you think was like the hardest part mm. for each of y'all? It's more just like a reflection question. <laughs> yeah, I need to set the research direction. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, that's mine too. Like at first, I was confused with our demographic. It like super confused me. So I'm, saying, I'm studying this group. I'm studying mm -hmm. like like the phrase that we mentioned. Um, people who have thought of social right. issues. So. But also, like, personally, this was my first time writing a paper. So that was cool. Yeah. Sorry, Tanisha, to put you on the spot. Yeah, mine was about, like, writing out the interview questions to, like, see how we can, like, anticipate possible challenges and, um, like, like Warren said, like, teasing out different intersections. Cool. Thank you all. Okay. If can someone else time? Mm, yes. yes. Do we have a volunteer to time? I can. Thank you. Sure. And so just signal them when they're at 11 minutes, okay? Bye. 
Hi everyone, today we will be talking about improving accessibility of VR for users with motor impairments. My name is Ashley, this is Brennan, and this is Anusha, and we worked under Dr. Stephen Feiner at Columbia University. So in this clip, we will be previewing um, the game that we built off of, an open source game that we found on the cup, and yeah, showing a clip of one of our collaborators playing the game. So here we can see Stuart, one of our collaborators, playing the game without the use of his hands. But did you share the audio? There's no audio for this. Oh, it's a good one. Yeah, and here you can see um, our mobile application that we built. Can you describe it? Um, I guess for this game, um, you can see Stuart basically, you know, moving around in his, or moving around, and um, he's basically using one of the controllers that we were playing with, and then the touchscreen application, he can use like a stylus to move forward and like to double tap to shoot. We'll describe it a little bit, yeah, or you should describe it <laughs> a little bit more. In this slide, we will discuss current accessibility in VR motor impairments. Um, there are currently very few alternative controllers or commercially, commercially available hardware modifications. Um, the first accessible software that we looked into is called Walking VR, which, is, um, which allows VR games to be um, adapted to individual needs of people with um, mobility limitations. Currently, Walking VR isn't accessible for all disabilities. So, um, but it allows modifications like height control and other controller modifications. Um, research has also studied facial expressions in 3D control games, but not in VR. And for game specific features, we looked into a game like Beat Saber, which offers modes like short person mode and I guess like a one hand mode. And then now we will be introducing our collaborators. The first one being Stuart Tucker Lundy. Let's check the audio and share this. Yeah. You should be able to share the audio from the little ellipsis menu. If you can't uh, you share it, check the box at the bottom. <laughs> If you guys are mute and would you mute? Because I think there's a couple people on the I think I'm muted. Yeah, it's it's probably just a screen share. Can you see it? Can you unscreen share? You want to share computer audio when you actually oh, get the Yeah. So stop share first. Or you can go into more. I believe you can do this more. Share. The bottom left. The bottom is up to the video. So I'm saying share. Nice. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stuart Turkelundi. I'm 55 years old, and I'm also a quadriplegic. I've been a quadriplegic for 41 years. Actually, uh, uh, being a quadriplegic uh, brings on its own set of uh, unique uh, uh, problems and uh, difficulty, difficulties and also barriers. I, for one, can't use my hands. So uh, I rely on a lot of uh, styluses and things like that to uh, help me so uh but uh got some help i think you're gonna like the kind of help i got and then our next collaborator is lauren Sanger. hi my name is lauren uh i am a disabled person and uh 
a VR enthusiast and I've worked in accessibility and accessibility within VR is very important to me. Um, I have mobility, gait, and dexterity issues, including motor skill issues. I have a tendency to drop things a lot with my hands, um, issues with standing like straight sometimes, and I'm hoping that my participation in this collaborative effort can help further accessibility in VR. Hi, my name is Lauren. Awesome. Now that we've covered the background of motor accessibility for virtual reality uh, and introduced our collaborators, I'll talk more about our approach and the development process. Uh, so we decided to implement accessibility features into a pre-existing game that had not been designed with accessibility in mind. This allowed us to focus the majority of our time on accessibility without having to worry about developing the game. Uh, we decided to find a first-person shooter game that was open source through GitHub. Uh, there's an image of the game on the screen. There's some cargo containers in the background and a warehouse with an enemy NPC in the foreground pointing a gun at the camera. Uh, this game was chosen because one of our collaborators, Stuart, had previous experience playing uh, first-person shooter style games on their iPad, such as Call of Duty. Uh, the next step in our process was to understand the challenges that our collaborators face while using VR. Uh, so we've listed those here. Uh, they include difficulties holding the controllers and using buttons, uh, inability to stand, or trouble moving and rotating the body in physical space. They also struggled putting on the headset and some experienced VR sickness. While VR sickness isn't specific to motor or dexterity impairments, it was an issue that some of them faced. We wanted to consider that in this process. Um, and it's just a sense of nausea because the headset is showing moving images while your body is staying so. Awesome. So we're going to talk now about some of the accessibility features that we implemented. We broke those into three categories. So the first one is what we're considering standard accessibility features. Uh, we made the game easier to play while seated. We implemented snap turning, which allows uh, to rotate the field of view without moving your head, uh, and VR tunneling to reduce motion sickness. So there's a graphic on the slide now to, uh, that depicts tunneling. Uh, it's a square picture with a black vignette, including all but a circle in the center. And through the circle, you can see the game, which includes a cargo container and a warehouse. Uh, the next feature that we developed was a mobile control application. Since one of our collaborators, Stuart, was unable to hold the Oculus controllers at all, uh, we needed a different way for him to interact with the game. Uh, so since he had previous experience using his iPad to play games, we thought that using a touchscreen uh, application to control the game would not only be accessible, but it would be familiar to him and more comfortable to use. So the game allows for swiping, or the, sorry, the mobile application allows for swiping, dragging, and touch input to move, rotate, and interact with objects within the game. The next thing that we worked on uh, is interaction techniques, specifically with the gun. Uh, when you spawn in the game, when you spawn in the game, there's a gun laying out in front of you that you have to grab before you can start playing it. Um, obviously, if you're unable to use any of the buttons on the controller, that can be quite an issue. So uh, we developed a different way to interact with the gun, which would be since Stuart, our collaborator, has a stylus on his left hand, his right hand is uh, essentially free to use. So we took the controller and he just puts it on his wrist like so. From there, he's able to move his entire arm around to move the gun around, but he doesn't need to use uh, his fingers at all. And then to pick up the gun, uh, we created a system where he can just hover his hand over the gun and it will uh, snap to his hand. In addition to this, and after kind of experimenting with this more, we realized there were some issues with it, such as that if you drop the gun, it's really hard to find it and pick it up again. Um, so kind of just as a fail safe, we implemented um, a different technique where if you just click the A button at any point in the time, um, if wherever the gun is on the screen, it'll snap to your hand. That way it prevents it from being lost. And we also implemented head gaze, so if you look at the gun, um, it will snap to your hand. Now, uh, Stuart will give a short uh, clip about his experience. It, it makes you feel like you you have a lot more freedom to move around. Um, it it's really really cool. I'm not lying. It's really cool. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, make more of these games, please, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. We hope to continue making more of these games um, by continuing our collaborative iterative development process. Uh, there's still a few bugs that we want to fix in the game. Um, one being that the right-hand controller method that I just described seems to be a bit finicky and not too comfortable for him. Uh, so we want to brainstorm other ways that we can implement um, gun interactions. 
And then we also, he's also mentioned that since he's in a raised wheelchair, when he puts the headset on, for some reason, the height is kind of off and he feels like he's uh, very low to the ground and quite short. Uh, so we want to adjust the height in the game so that his experience in VR matches his experience in the world. Um, and the final thing that we want to do is we implemented head gaze quite recently and it's too sensitive, so we need to desensitize that. After making those fixes, we want to move on to, the, to doing a user study. So we will find users that can hopefully um, be aided by our accessibility features that we've implemented. Um, and the first step of doing that would be to go through the RB submission process. After the user study and after um, acquiring that feedback, we hope to de develop this on a larger scale. Um, and there's two ways that we're considering doing that. One is by creating something that users can implement themselves, um, such as walk in VR, which we described earlier. Uh, this is something that would allow users to play any game um, using that modification that we built, or we can create something more on the developer side uh, in which developers can more easily, such as seeing VR, can more easily uh, implement accessibility features, motor accessibility features into their games. Thank you, thank you to all of the professors and all the other students. Um, it was a great summer. <laughs> and yeah, we have time for questions now. It's true. I was a little bit confused on the setup. He, yeah. You mentioned a tablet, a stylus, and a headset. How did that work exactly? Yeah. Um, so uh, Stuart, of course, is wearing the headset to experience the virtual reality of the visuals. Um, and then with his left hand, he has a it's seen in the picture here. It's a um, attachment on his wrist that allows him to put a stylus in his hand that it can use to control the mobile application. And then we strap the right controller onto it under his right hand. Um, so he has a headset on. He's using his left hand to move and rotate using the touchscreen application and then his right hand to orient the gun. Wait, so what is he moving and rotating? Uh, his, yeah, his player body or avatar. Okay, so he's so he's staying still, but he's mm -hmm. rotating his body with his hand. Yeah, so, so the, he sees what he sees is like motion, as though he was moving around. Yes, yeah. Interesting. Was what that about like the snap turning? Yeah, so and also he can like swipe left or right to snap turn, and all well, that's implemented on the touch screen. Okay, okay. Was that, um, did that give him motion sickness? Is there any issues with that? Yeah, so he did experience um, some motion sickness. Uh, so we are planning to increase the effect of the tunneling. Um, some ways that he was able to mitigate that is um, he actually didn't use the snap turn as much as he used um, moving around just with his wheelchair itself, like turning with his wheelchair. Um, and then he didn't mention the motion sickness, but he also mentioned that there could be other things in place, such as like that he's never, he hasn't experienced that kind of movement in a long time. Um, so he mentioned, you know, that his legs felt wobbly. Interesting. So yeah, there's, there's a lot to explore there, but um, cool. <laughs> I had a question as well. Um, I thought this is super cool work. Um, I feel like it's already difficult to, like, for users who can't have full freedom of movement and such, it's already difficult to map a control scheme that, like, is obvious and easy for them to use. And so if there are limitations on what they can use, then it, I imagine it'll be even more difficult. Um, one question I had was, it seemed like for Stuart, he was able to use his left hand and his fingers to move the stylus around, um, or left or right. Um, yeah. Did he also have that same range of motion on his right hand, or was there a limitation that got y'all to design the controller of holding as opposed to having a second stylus or something else on the hand? So he doesn't have any control over any of his fingers. Oh, okay. The stylus is actually like an attachment that kind of goes over his wrist. I see. And he's gotten pretty good at playing uh, games with that because he likes to game on his iPad. Exactly. <laughs> um, so it was, that's why we implemented that control scheme. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yes, the right hand was just because we wanted to like give him that feeling of holding the gun and moving it. Mm -hmm. um, wasn't completely successful, but we're glad that it kind of, it worked at least. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Cool. Thank you. Questions? Questions from Zoom? I don't think any on Zoom. 
Thank you guys. <laughs> We're doing good on time. Dylan said he'll try to get this on YouTube next week. <laughs> If you have sound and video, you might want to click those on the bottom. If you don't, it's okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Sofiana. I'm Chloe. I'm Josh. And we have been working with Gaurav Jain and Professor Brian Smith in the Computer Enhanced Abilities Lab at Columbia on research on how we can leverage street cameras to support outdoor navigation for blind pedestrians. So just a brief overview of what we're going to talk about. So for some context, um, many blind and low vision people use GPS based navigation systems in order to help them navigate outdoors. Um, these systems aim to provide ter turn by turn instructions, um, but the problem is that oftentimes they lack real time precise information about users location and surroundings. Um, and so this research aims to explore the potential use of these street cameras in order to address these problems. Um, that are faced by blind and low vision users using this GPS-based assistive technology. Um, so there are three primary research questions that we're focusing on. Um, the primary, the research question one is what aspects of outdoor navigation are challenging when using GPS-based assistance? Um, research question two is how can a street camera based system be designed to you to address these challenges um, and research question three is to what extent can street based street camera based navigation systems actually address these problems. Um, so we conducted a formative study that essentially was aiming to address research question one. Um, for, as a reminder, which was which aspects of outdoor navigation do blind and low vision people find challenging when using these GPS based assistive technologies. Um, and so we conducted uh, six formative studies. There's a table displayed of the demographic information of the six uh, participants of the formative study. Um, we used critical incident technique um, where we asked them essentially to describe their process of navigation. And we tried to get into the minds a little bit of the users. Um, we then analyzed the transcripts uh, using in vivo and found some common themes from the formative study that we intended to use to further develop the system. Um, so there were three main findings from this formative study. The first was anticipating environment layout. Um, a lot of the participants said that they were not confident and in the GPS instructions that they were given by these apps um, because of the way that the apps were describing the environment layout. They weren't able to um, kind of anticipate what was coming next. Um, specifically, um, a lot an issue that came up multiple times was specific alleyways where the app would um, wouldn't say whether or not there was an alleyway and sometimes they um the users would walk into an alleyway as opposed to um turning where they were supposed to on the next block um the second finding was about obstacle awareness um where participants said it was hard for them to identify obstacles 
um, and thereby avoid, avoid them. And there wasn't a lot of assistance using these GPS instructions, uh, the GPS, GPS based instructions. Um, and so there was a lot of instances of tripping over traffic cones or signs posts that are placed in front of stores, um, et cetera. Um, the third finding was relating to crossing street intersections, that the audio cues that are sometimes available on crosswalks were not even sufficient for the users because it the traffic flow and other environment environment noise gets in the way of being able to kind of uh, single out what's going on. Um, and so it caused uncertainty around how long they had to cross the street and whether and they weren't didn't feel so so confident in when they were crossing the street. Just quick question, were these cane users, dog users? Did they have mobility aids? Um, yeah, so there were a few different, um, everyone had like a little bit of a different, what, what they used. Um, so most of them use canes. Um, they rank, I can go back on the table, they ranked their familiarity with specific assist assistive technologies. Um, so there was only one participant that said that they were not at all familiar with assistive technologies like apps and things like that. Um, well, I'm asking because a mobility aid, I wouldn't necessarily consider that an assistive technology. I don't know if the participants would consider that an assistive technology. Oh, so like you see what I'm saying? This, there were six users. Two of them had guide dogs and the other four had white kids. Okay, because the tripping over cones, that's something that an app is like not going to help you with. That's got to be your cane or your dog. So anyway. Keep going. <laughs> then the system. So um, we have three main components to our system. One is the street cameras. We have two cameras. One is on the second floor, and the other one is on the twelfth floor of the building. Um, that's like on the corner of the like in the cross section, intersection. And then we have a computational server that uh, it takes. That's the thing that processes the videos, and it also like stores the the like memory of like the map layout of like. Um, the street, the crosswalks, and uh, tracks people. And then we have the iPhone app where the user will uh, has an app on their phone, and that's how it uh, interacts with the system. So um, this is the system overview. So uh, it's a smartphone application. And so the way it works for the user would be uh, they go on the app, they would want to press connect, and then the camera is like looking for them and then they will just wave their hand and then the camera will like with like a battery box will kind of like mark them as like a waved person like that's the uh, blind or low vision user and then um when they're like crossing the intersection uh like let's say this is like the, the crosswalk if they like start veering then uh there will be like some beeping sounds and like the more you veer then the more like the more rapid the beeping is and then when you like face the correct direction, it gives you like some like uh, haptic feedback so that you know that's like the correct way to go. Um, so specifically relating to the mobile app, as Chloe explained, um, there's the haptic and audio feedback that helps the user prevent veering, avoiding obstacles, and helps with crossing the street safely by providing different information relating to um, the information the camera can see of whether or not it's safe to cross the street at that point, things like that. Um, there's the guidance mode that gives the general audio instructions for navigation to this specific point of interest. Um, and then there's also a feature in which the user can scrub their finger across the screen um, in order to see kind of like the overall bird's eye view layout of the intersection of the area that they're in. And so on the screen, there are three um, kind of screenshots of the app displayed. Um, one showing it's waving your hands in the air to connect with an end connection button that's at the bottom. Um, the second screen has the bird's eye view of the map with the street. Um, and that's where the user would be able to scrub their finger over the map to understand where's the crosswalk and where's the street. Um, and then finally, it shows the app when it's in the guidance mode um, with 
a kind of vector arrow pointing in different directions of where the user is heading and whether or not it's on track. This is all given in audio and haptic feedback for the user, obviously, as well. Um, and so here is a brief demo. I'm not. I'm not. Um, enable voiceover. Okay. I turn voiceover on. I'm not. I'm not. Double tap to open. I'm not. Connect. Button. And connection. Wave one hand above your head. Connection. Sweet. Cross lock. Sweet. Cross lock. Sweet. Sweet. Cross lock. Sweet. Cross lock. Sweet. 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 Select destination. Select destination. Button. Select destination. Select destination. Bus stop. Bus stop. But grocery. Button. Bus stop. Bus. But grocery. Button. Path overview. Walk 25 feet to the crosswalk and wait for the signal. Walk 56 feet across the crosswalk. Turn right and walk 20 feet to reach the. Start navigation. Button. Interactive map. Image. Use the rotor to enable direct touch for this app. Walk 25 feet to the crosswalk and wait for the signal. So um, the way that the, we use the camera is we have a machine learning model. We use the MM Action 2 machine learning model. Um, it uses spatial temporal action detection. So uh, the AI, it recognizes like, oh, that's a person and like, oh, that's a vehicle. Um, it also recognizes the actions. We're like training the model right now um, to like detect like, oh, this person's standing, they're walking, they're waving. Um, and so we actually uh, made our own data set. So we like recorded the video um and then we like pop some like boundary boxes for people to, like uh for our own data set to train the model with it was like 200 crops <laughs> and then this video is like uh, with the app and like how it looks on the camera um so we're currently in the process of designing the pilot um and user studies um, the main goals of these studies are to compare the experience of blind and low vision users um, between two systems, our system, which is iPad Nav, and a GPS-based system. We are going to be comparing it specifically to BlindSquare, which is um, from our research and our formative studies, kind of the most popular and somewhat of the gold standard, although it is frankly, not good, um, not great. Um, and we also aim to test the system for technical issues and other user interface. So once the pilot is ready, we'll use it together inside on the system and the app and we'll iterate over it to improve it and get it ready for the user study. In our long-term vision, the system is to investigate how accessibility can be embedded within the city infrastructure. Instead of an afterthought that usually requires people to buy expensive hardware or app subscriptions, So we would like to thank Gaurav and Dr. Brian Smith and the SEAL Lab at Columbia and XR Access um, for this awesome experience and getting the opportunity to participate. Uh, we already have two questions from Zoom. So oh, um, Stuart, you want to start? Uh, yes, I just wanted to say really quick, uh, all of your work is, I've been in the wheelchair for 41 years, I'm a quadriplegic, 
And I just want to tell you, thank you so much for doing this type of work. When I first got injured, I was handed a what they call a mouth stick. And it had a, a basically a piece of denture that goes in a stick and on a keyboard. And uh, you use it with your head. And to see where we're at now is incredible. So I thank each of you with the bottom of my heart. And keep on doing the work you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tamara, you want to go next? Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, so first, I just want to say all three of these presentations were really, really um, interesting. So I appreciate the work that you've all done this summer. My question, though, is I wondered if you had looked into using like a smartwatch and using Siri or some other similar application so that they can talk and have their watch um, use the haptics instead of the phone. The phone seems like it could be a little clumsy. That is the ultimate goal right now for as for prototyping purposes, we're using the iPhone. We have discussed that the end goal is to develop also a way to implement this for an Apple Watch or other type of smartwatch um, because it is difficult, especially for people who are using white canes um, to hold the phone and the cane and be able to like in case you're holding something else. It's just it exactly it's it can get a little bit clunky. Um, so yes, that is the end goal for the haptic and audio feedback. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And Claudia? Hi, guys. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this work. As a totally blind person, I greatly appreciate it. Um, the, the two questions that I have are, the first one is how Exactly. Can you explain a little bit about like what do you mean by obstacle detection? Because yeah, there was um, there was a person that did specify, and I do agree with her that usually the white cane or the guide dog um, will guide you around an obstacle. So I was a little bit confused about that. And the second one is which camera does this app use? Is this using your smartphone camera? Or is this using like a street cameras for lights or something? Could you explain that a little bit more? Thank you. Certainly. Um, so to address the second question first, um, right now for the prototype, while we're testing and researching for the system, we have two cameras that are um, positioned on our building that we're that are that's right outside the intersection that we've been testing. There's one on the second floor and the 12th floor. Um, the point of this research is to be able to leverage existing street cameras. So we hope that in the future, this is able to use existing street cameras um, that we can just add this on um, and be able to use the existing infrastructure. Um, and then the first question was um, absolutely um, completely understood. In our formative studies, there were users that specified that even though they do have guide dogs or canes, um, they still would bump into different um, obstacles that were kind of unclear um, about the sh like the shape was unclear. So one specifically was like the folding boards that are posted outside of shops. Um, also. There were some people who uh, in the formative studies said that they would like this, they would appreciate a feature like this in general um, so that they don't have to rely as much on mobility aids such as um, a white cane. I hope, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I had a question as well, kind of related to what you were talking about with the um, street camera. Um, I was wondering um, how easy it was to set those up or to find street cameras in general. And like, I feel like at least in the US, it seems like concerns about mass surveillance or privacy might be an issue compared to, I know, like, for example, like when I'm in Korea, like there's mass CCTV, like mm -hmm. cameras everywhere. And that's allowed by the government, but not here. So I was just wondering what that looks like here. 
Um, for the cameras, we were working with this other team, it's like Cosmos. Um, I actually don't know too much like the process process of like how we got access to it. Mm -hmm. um, as for privacy, like we don't like use it for anything else, like only for the system. Right. Well, one thing I thought was really nice was that the user has to request access by waving, mm -hmm. right? Instead of doing something more um, like paternalistic where it like detects a mobility aid and decides you need help or something like that. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I thought that was something nice that they. Any questions? I would agree with that. I do like the method of waving to connect. It's pretty cute and pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> It was fun to we've been testing it out so we go outside on the intersection the whole lab will go we'll all just like be waving for a while this is like how we tested the and like trained the machine learning models oh, yeah. and the computer vision and people would get very confused <laughs> yeah. and people would wave back and it was funny it was it was fun. um if nobody else has a question they'll ask another one yeah so it seems like the main feature that you guys implemented was basically helping people stay on track when they're crossing the intersection, right? Like that was the main goal of the app. I think that's one of the main goals. I think two things. One is that the goals are kind of still in progress, that they've been, they're being updated as we go a lot um, and kind of, we find out new things and we don't necessarily think that the way that we're describing it right now is going to be exactly how it will be even a week from now. Sure. Et cetera. Yeah, I understand. That's always um, the formative process. But uh, do any of the apps that exist, like BlindSquare, like I haven't actually used BlindSquare. Do, do any of the apps that exist give any support for crossing intersections? So what we've noticed we did a lot of research on like the existing apps and most of there aren't apps that have all of these features in one place so there are apps where if there is an app that it will tell you when to cross the street but it doesn't tell you anything else is that oko okay -O? i can't remember off the top of my head the name um i can go back to my notes and no, find it okay. after but yeah. um but there so there are apps that deal with veering and there are apps that deal with obstacle detection and but this is kind of we're hoping to in addition to just the leveraging street cameras we also want to create a place where everything can be or not everything but more than just these limited things can be done mm -hmm. okay uh, cool. if it's okay if it's okay if i can step in um i use blind square on a daily basis no it does not tell you where like the layout of the street or you know where the which street you know which intersections it will tell you which intersection you're on but it doesn't really tell you the layout of the street or when you're veering or anything like that okay any other questions we're good okay nicole Yep. Thank you, everyone, right, for joining on the all. Zoom. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for joining on the Zoom. Thank you all. Your presentations were great. Hope you had fun summers.